love you. This simple phrase, expressed in countless languages down the centuries, has performed many roles. It served as a lover's mantra, an affirmation of family bonds, a sex worker's role play, an emotional blackmailer's weapon, a domestic abuser's justification, a celebrity's message to fans, a stalker's confession, a songwriter's lyric, to name just a few. Clearly, what lies behind a declaration of love isn't always love. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. And we shouldn't let a little sugar coating trick us into accepting an inferior product. Of the declarations of love I've received in my time, a substantial percentage share a peculiar distinction in that they were supposedly made on behalf of the most loving beings ever to exist. Beings whose love supposedly sets the diamond standard. Beings called gods. In view of these extravagant claims, it's reasonable to expect a model of love that surpasses anything even the most benevolent human being could offer. Instead, we find a phenomenon that in its most innocuous form inspires conflict just as effectively as comfort, and that its most lethal is underpinned by corruption, oppression, negation, narcissism, enslavement, and delusion. Folks who've approached me over the years with promises of their God's love have responded in various ways when I've declined their offer. Some have acknowledged my rejection respectfully. Others have suggested I must be damaged in some way, expressing hopes that I might someday be healed. Others have nosedived into zealot mode, criticising my ingratitude for what seems to them the most precious gift. In these two videos, I want to set out my reasons for rejecting this apparent gift explaining why all of us, including them, deserve better. At school, I belong to a group called Christian Union. Besides Bible reading and prayers to the Christian God, Yahweh, activities included other playful improvisational exercises. I remember two sessions that focused specifically on Yahweh's love. The first one united the group in seemingly unstoppable enthusiasm. The second was a disaster, creating huge tension and leaving the group confused and fragmented. In the first session, one of the teachers, Ms. Chapel, wrote on the blackboard the unfinished sentence, God's love is like... We were all invited to complete the analogy. There was an avalanche of answers. God's love is like an elevator. It lifts you up. God's love is like a volcano, hot and explosive. God's love is like the sun, it lights up the world. God's love is like a rock, it's solid and reliable. And so on. High praise indeed. And yet not a single one of us had ever experienced Yahweh or his love, a fact that was admitted months later when I pressed the whole group for details about their experiences. So, how could we produce this stream of glowing analogies? The term creation ex nihilo is often used in reference to the belief that the universe was fashioned from nothing by gods. But in a universe devoid of detectable gods, the term applies in reverse. We have to create gods from nothing. We have to animate absence. How this is done is no mystery. We see the same principles in action after bereavement. When loved ones die, many of us continue to behave as if they're with us. We talk about them. We talk to them. We reflect on physical reminders of them. When we do these things, with enough frequency and focus, the as-if seems to fade, and we can lull ourselves into a powerful fantasy that they are indeed with us. What we're really doing is keeping our memories vividly alive. We use exactly the same methods to breathe life into non-existent deities. We keep physical reminders of them to reflect on. We talk to them, in prayer, in some religions, this is required several times every day, maintaining frequency and focus. And lastly, we talk about them. But here, there's a problem. We have absolutely no memories to draw on. It's no good pointing to some wizened old deity in a dusty old book, depicting some bygone magical epoch, when stupefying public miracles, angelic visitations, and even divine interactions were commonplace. Plainly, we don't live in that world. We see no grand suspensions of the physical laws, no angels come knocking on our doors, and no divine voices rumble across the globe. Just resounding silence. Simply put, if we honestly reported our actual experience of gods, we'd have precisely nothing to say. 
So, we have to create something out of nothing. To do this, appropriately enough, we flip concepts into their opposites. Beings that are nowhere to be found get magically flipped into beings who are everywhere, found in every moment and every location in the universe. Beings with no detectable existence get magically flipped into beings that constitute all existence. If human love is expressed in the actions of humans, then divine love is expressed in the actions of the universe. The day-to-day -day events that we call life. With this distorted concept in place, we can now claim as much love as we want. If we get a new job, this apparent gift from the universe can be claimed as divine love. If we lose both legs in an accident, we can claim divine love here too. The universe didn't let us die. If we die after a drawn-out, agonizing bout of cancer, even this can be spun into a claim of divine love by those we leave behind. The universe ended our suffering. Every experience becomes a potential win for divine love, either because of what did happen or what mercifully didn't happen. Branches of some religions give particular focus to more negative experiences. In his Revival of Religious Learnings, Al-Ghazali, a revered Islamic theologian and philosopher born in the 11th century, conveys the signs of love from the Islamic god Allah. The Prophet said, When God loves a servant, he throws him into dangers and difficulties. When he loves him with full love, he purifies him, making him sincere. Later on, I'll return to this curious term, making him sincere. So, even though we have no actual experiences of God's, by interpreting arbitrary life events as signs of divine love, we can create a limitless supply of fantasy-based pseudo-experiences of God's to help sustain the illusion that they're with us. Which is how, one lunchtime, a group of children in a London school were able to generate a torrent of analogies about the gigantic love of a God that every one of those children would later admit they'd never experienced. But this big, big love brings some big, big problems. In Davis Grubb's thriller, Night of the Hunter, preacher Harry Powell roams the American countryside, murdering widows. As he drives, he thanks his God for sending him money to preach his word, money taken from his victims. Harry Powell believes his God loves him too, and that his God demonstrates that love by lining up victims for him. By inventing a bogus love that can be found in any life event, with no standard of verification, we don't just create a resource to comfort the meek. We create a resource for anyone, including bullies, demagogues, supremacists, murderers, who can and do use it to justify their belief that the gods are on their side. The potential for abuse here is especially underscored when believers are instructed to find signs of love in dangers and difficulties, as Al-Ghazali indicates. Dangers and difficulties are often warning signs to stop what we're doing because it's harmful to ourselves or others. We also have to ask, is this a veiled invitation to martyrdom? After all, if we commit abusive and illegal acts, dangers and difficulties will swiftly come our way. Is that a sign of divine love? Moreover, if we reduce our dangers and difficulties by living in peace and harmony with our fellow humans, is that to be taken as a sign that we're not loved? This is the mess we get into when we attempt to satisfy our human longing for love by illegitimate means. In that first Christian Union session, we were all too swept up in the moment to notice any problems. But in another session a few weeks later, the problems were painfully obvious. A Christian guest speaker, I'll call him Bill, had been invited to talk about his faith. I later found out he and Miss Chapel attended the same evangelical church. Bill was an actor. We recognised him from a beer commercial on TV, so it wasn't surprising that he was a great storyteller. He recounted his spiritual journey with contagious humour and passion, and things might have been okay if he'd stuck to his script, but he decided to improvise. He'd been talking about his experience of Yahweh's love, and in a moment of inspiration, he announced that he could feel that love in the room right now. He looked around at each of us in turn, then he uttered four deadly words. Can you feel it? I was stumped. I couldn't say yes. That would be a lie. But I couldn't say no, for various reasons. First, on the most basic level, it seemed rude. Bill was clearly going for a moment here, and saying no seemed to stomp all over it. Second, we'd been very effectively trained in Christian Union to always agree with and affirm experiences of Yahweh. Third, 
If Bill could actually feel Yahweh's love and I couldn't, maybe that meant there was something wrong with me. Gradually, I became aware that none of the other children were answering yes either. When I looked round, I saw they were all just as confused. Faced with a circle of mute mouths, Bill started repeating his question and began targeting specific individuals. Still no one answered. His tone became impatient and interrogating. The tension became excruciating. I remember looking over at Ms. Chapel, sitting on the sidelines, and noticing that her face had frozen in a sickly grin. I realised she could see the problem. Gradually, more members of the group started looking over at her, until eventually the only one who wasn't was Bill. When he finally followed suit, Ms. Chapel announced we were out of time. The room emptied with uncharacteristic speed, and the incident was never mentioned. There was something odd about Bill's behaviour that I couldn't pinpoint at the time. Sometime later, I realised what it was. When we see that someone's confused by something we've said, we instinctively try to rectify the situation. We inquire about what's confusing them. We rephrase. We offer explanations. Bill did none of this. He saw we were all baffled by his question, but bizarrely, he just kept repeating it, with escalating frustration. This wasn't about understanding. It was about compliance. Bill wanted to hear some yeses from this group of 12 and 13 year olds. Pressure tactics are widespread in religion. We see it when children are pressurised into speaking in tongues. Children who are quite understandably reluctant to participate in this ridiculous, undignified babbling are warned that if they don't open their mouths, the Holy Spirit can't talk. And soon, the gibberish flows. Thankfully, we didn't succumb to Bill's pressure tactics. But I know from years of correspondence that many folks have suffered with tremendous guilt and anxiety because they never felt the sensation of divine love that others claim to feel. So what exactly does this sensation feel like? Here are just a few responses gathered from the internet. A wonderful peace and bliss. You'll know it's the real thing because mere words will not be able to describe it. Warmness in your chest peace of mind, peace of heart, joy, numbness in your legs, a little bit like electricity, sort of a pat on the head. It's beyond words. You will have to experience it for yourself to understand the true feeling of God's love. These responses pretty much reflect the kinds of reactions I've had from people in private conversation. What's immediately striking is that people are clearly describing wildly different and incompatible sensations. And the feelings aren't always fluffy. A Christian once told me divine love felt like fear. This is the chaos you get when people are urged to identify some physical sensation without any guiding criteria. So what justifications do people give for ascribing divinity to these diverse sensations? Some say it's because they can't explain them. But failure to explain something isn't evidence of divinity, just ignorance. Some say it's because the sensations happen when they think about their God. Well... We get all kinds of physical sensations when we think about various significant individuals in our lives, including humans, animals, and even fictional characters, from dull nausea, to heart-pounding outrage, to sleepy peace, to dizzy euphoria. Would we argue that these individuals are exerting some metaphysical force on us to produce these sensations? Of course not. What's ironic is that if we look at the argument being presented here, the connection between thought and sensation is already made. The sensations happen when they think about their God. They have it in their own words. Thought gives rise to sensation. Some take refuge in the claim that they just know it for a fact. But claims of infallibility are extremely hazardous to work with, as the Catholic popes no doubt discovered. Papal infallibility was declared in formal doctrine in the 1800s. It didn't mean everything the popes uttered was preserved from error, only certain rare pronouncements on faith. The reason for this rarity becomes clear when you consider what happens if any new infallible statement is found to refute any previous infallible statement. Infallibility allows no refutation. Every infallible statement made throughout history has to line up. One single contradiction and the game's up. Far from offering popes some wonderful freedom to say what they like and have it accepted as truth, papal infallibility walls them in, progressively limiting what they're able to say. Wise pontiffs will make as few officially infallible statements as possible. In everyday life, people aren't always so cautious. They claim to just know, all the time. And fatal contradictions quickly arise 
when their supposedly infallible testimonies don't line up with those of others. Some folks describe divine love as sensations we're all familiar with, joy, warmth, fear. Others claim that the defining feature of the sensation is that it's impossible to describe. A sensation can't be both possible and impossible to describe. Some folks present divine love as one specific, distinctive type of sensation. Others suggest divine love can be experienced in completely different ways by different people. A sensation can't be both one distinctive sensation and many unrelated sensations. These contradictions demonstrate that at least some of these people must be wrong, which in turn demonstrates that it's perfectly possible to believe divine love is unmistakable and yet be mistaken. The major religions have us chasing divine love in arbitrary life events and arbitrary physical sensations. We might as well be chasing clouds. In many species, the offspring's survival will hinge on its parents' protection. In these cases, the bond between parent and offspring is predictably extremely intense. Parents develop muscularly protective instincts towards their offspring, and the offspring develop equally muscular trusting instincts towards their parents. But sometimes, this bond gets hijacked by other species for their own purposes. The cuckoo is a brood parasite that exploits the parental instincts of other species like reed warblers by laying its own eggs in their nests, fooling them into treating the young cuckoo as their own. When it hatches, the cuckoo is hardwired to push all the other eggs out of the nest so that the adopted parent can focus exclusively on feeding its mammoth appetite. A reverse example, where a false parent is introduced, is seen with the goose. Within the first few hours of hatching from their egg, baby geese will bond with the first suitable object they experience and then follow that object over land, water and air. In the wild, this first object will generally be their parent, but many humans have exploited this process, known as imprinting, to gain amazing video footage of geese in flight by establishing themselves as that first object, so that when they later take to a speedboat or hang glider, the imprinted geese will follow. Human children are dependent on their parents for an unusually long developmental period compared to other species. Typically, they'll display an unquestioning trust and submissiveness to their parents for a significant part of that development. In theory, this should be a good survival strategy because their parents are likely to be the most fiercely protective adults in those formative years. To mistrust or resist their parents at that early stage might actively endanger them. But sometimes, these survival instincts are hijacked for other purposes. Not by other species, but by ideologies. Religions, such as the various branches of Christianity and Islam, attempt to introduce a false father in the form of an invisible god, a parasitic parent that will divert and endlessly exploit the child's natural instincts of trust and submission. In healthy human parent-child relationships, the growing child develops into an independent, self-reliant adult. Unquestioning trust and submission resolve into healthy challenge and mutual respect. Parental hypocrisies are acknowledged and recede. But in the parasitic God relationship, the growing child becomes fixed in an undeveloped infantilized stage, remaining psychologically stunted in a child's mindset. Unquestioning trust and submission are perpetually demanded under threat of punishment. Parental hypocrisies are denied and continue. But the most striking difference is this. In healthy human parent-child relationships, the parent gives relentless demonstrations of love to the child, actively protecting, affirming, reassuring, empathizing, nurturing, and teaching. In the parasitic God relationship, the parent demands relentless demonstrations of love from the child, requiring constant declarations and acts of devotion. In fact, with this role reversal of the child feeding the parent, the parasite that gods most closely resemble is the cuckoo, the baby bird with the ever open beak. While these cuckoos don't themselves have the ability to kill, being mythical characters, stories in the Bible and Quran, such as Abraham's instruction to sacrifice his own son, depict both Yahweh and Allah desiring to have family members ready to kill each other on command. What kind of loving parents want their families ready to kill each other? This should be the point where families wake up and see that they've been taken over by something extremely malignant. But the cuckoo works to separate them from each other, 
We come back to Al-Ghazali's commentary and the curious concept of making a servant sincere. What's meant by this is that God does not leave for him his family and property. He makes him separate from others, and God comes in between him and other people and things. And apparently, gods aren't the only ones seeking to come between family members. Within Islam, the Hadith is a collection of books written long after the death of Muhammad, the self-proclaimed messenger of the Islamic god Allah. The Hadith gathers together reports of Muhammad's life from various sources. These have been subdivided by Islamic scholars into classifications of authentic, good, weak, or fabricated. In one passage, considered authentic, Muhammad is reported to have said, None of you is a believer till I am dearer to him than his child, his father, and the whole of mankind. This stupendous egotism is eerily echoed by the Christian Messiah Jesus in Matthew 10.37. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So we have Allah, Yahweh, Muhammad and Jesus, all demanding supremacy over every other human relationship. And we all know the punishments supposedly awaiting those who don't comply. Forget hate speech. For me, this is the most dangerous kind of language. The language of totalitarian ultimatums that seeks to conquer by dividing, trying to come between us and our most loved ones in order to achieve total subservience. My love isn't to be had for the asking. My love isn't to be had on the promise of a gift that gives nothing but takes endlessly. And my love certainly isn't to be had by anyone who attempts to dictate who I love. In part two, I'll be continuing my exploration, looking at slave mentality, at sacrifice, at shunning, and at the process of healing from this degrading love.